up next, Misha Toplitsky with Debiasing Peer Review with Voluntary Anonymization. All right. All right, so happy to present this joint work. Uh, this is with Ina, who's here in the crowd, and Daniel, who couldn't be here. And actually, I need a little clicker. Uh, let's see. All right, this works, great. Um, so the topic is, I think, you know, dear to many of our hearts, it's peer review, and in particular, bias. Um, so there's a long literature, you know, many of you guys have probably seen many, maybe all these studies um, looking at bias and peer review, uh, measuring it through anonymization or blinding, we'll, we'll call it anonymization. And in this literature, you know, people have looked at a number of kind of uh, aspects of identity, um, uh, you know, race, gender, et cetera. Uh, arguably the most kind of robust finding is around prestige. Um, so that's, that'll be our focus here. Um, and so, you know, we have this literature, it seems to be fairly robust, right? Anonymization seems to reduce prestige bias, um, but it's very much not universally adopted, right? Uh, especially to those of us, um, like, outside the social sciences, or those of us in social sciences that may come as a surprise, but in practice, uh, especially in physical sciences, this is somewhat rare. Most journals are single blind or single anonymous. You know, so why is that, you know? Well, a bunch of reasons, right? So maybe it's kind of just organizational inertia. Maybe some authors don't want this. Probably some authors don't want this. Um, maybe there's some benefits that we get from single anonymization mode, like maybe spotting conflicts of interest. Uh, and, you know, people also say, well, what, who cares anyway, right? You can always Google, and people probably do, so it's not really much of a, we shouldn't worry about this. So that's sort of one kind of set of reasons, the conventional one. Um, in addition, I think there's a compliance issue. Um, so, uh, you know, when we talk about anonymization, it's like someone should probably check if it was done correctly, that someone, you know, maybe at some point in the future will be an algorithm, but at least for now it's not. And at least one company that will be showing data from in a second found that it's actually extremely costly to do this checking, right? They estimated, the Institute of Physics Publishing estimated that it's, you know, almost 2,000 of editor hours per year, I think, um, that it cost them, right? Okay, so it's, you know, a little tricky, uh, maybe very tricky to implement, so uh, why not do the optional, uh, kind of voluntary version, right? That, that seems attractive, uh, you know, thinking emoji. Um, uh, let's see, so it seems attractive, but, right, and there are a bunch of kind of theoretical reasons uh, we might expect this not to work. So I think main, probably main reason comes to mind is strategic behavior, strategic responses. So, you know, probably people benefiting most from the system are probably going to be the ones who want to showcase their identities loud and loudly. Um, you know, and so if you do anonymize, it kind of shows you're not one of those people, right? So anonymization is a signal for kind of your identity. Um, and we can even kind of roll that, sort of roll that game forward where it's like, okay, the the second, you know, most prestigious person doesn't anonymize, all right, then the second most prestigious person thinks, well, you know, I'm the second, so, like, I also benefit from not anonymizing. And you kind of play that game forward, and then equilibrium, actually, no one should anonymize. Right? That would be, like, the economic prediction. Um, but, of course, there are some limits to strategic behavior. Um, in particular, you know, in this kind of setting, it might not be so obvious whether your identity kind of helps you or harms you if you are a super self-interested person which, you know, certainly I'm not, but I, I'm told some people, you know, care about their publishing outcomes. Um, so, um, so whether you benefit or not from the system may be a little kind of noisy, hard to predict, and also how exactly you kind of frame the choice probably matters, right? Like, is this a requirement? Is it, like, strongly encouraged? Is it just, like, an option? So maybe, like, culture and other kind of factors come into play. And also, you might worry about unintended consequences, right? If the name of the author is hidden and it's like a noble laureate, you know, maybe I want to review that paper immediately because let's say I want to learn from it or whatever. But if I don't see the name, maybe I'm less, less enthusiastic, right? So journals might worry about these kinds of, does it affect the recruitment of reviewers and authors? So that's a the theory. Fortunately, um, we do have a little bit of data, right, already. Um, and so this, uh, so Nature, journals tried this uh, uh, option in, 
uh, I forget exactly when this ro was rolled out. This is kind of summarized in this paper. Uh, they rolled this out across their journal portfolio, uh, analyzed about 100, you know, 10,000 submissions. And the paper is a bit, it's, it's worth reading. read, it's a bit kind of, I, I guess, ambivalent is what it sounds like. It's sort of, there was not a, uh, you know, 12% take up of this option. You know, you could say it's low, it gets, you know, debatable. They, uh, they didn't find an association with gender. They did find kind of some differences by country, a little bit of difference by prestige. Um, but the kind of crucial sort of takeaway from this project was that the, the design wasn't really designed, it wasn't designed to, to enable causal statements. So kind of nature rolled us out all at once, and it was hard to kind of conclude, does this causally reduce bias in any way? So that's where we hopefully uh, come in and contribute to. Um, so we're uh, working with Institute of Physics Publishing, which um, around uh, 2018 started this move to, uh, to double bond, double anonymous review. Um, they ended up making it an option. Uh, and so the option is framed, as you see here, Sort of, as an author, you can do that. We're not going to check. Kind of up to you guys, right? Um, the, so here's a bit on the data and measures. So we're going to be studying data from 57 journals in IOP's portfolio, covering, you know, as you can tell, a huge number of submissions from 2018 to 2022. Um, the journals were, um, like, the policy rollout was staggered. So it was kind of a set of journals a month that this option was uh, enabled on which is kind of perfect for kind of making causal statements, right? So that's, that's really, you know, the, the hearts and the eyes, you know, light up. Um, and when we're going to be talking about the effect, the causal effect of this policy, not the effect of anonymization, right? What happens when we enable authors to do this? Uh, we're going to measure pre author prestige in the following way with citations you got up to submission year. You know, we can kind of quibble about like what the right kind of bins are. You know, many, I, I believe a third of the authors in our sample have zero citations of time submission, a third of first authors. So we played around with this. It's going to turn out to not matter all that much. Um, uh, we use self, mostly self-reported gender and country. Um, and we'll be looking at review positivity in a kind of binary way. One, if it's, uh, you got accept or INR, and zero if reject. All right, so maybe I should be pointing here. All right, so who chooses to anonymize? Um, so comp the red line will be uh, our reference category, which is a person of quote unquote low prestige, so low citations, who is based in the USA and is male. So relative to this kind of hypothetical person, we see that people who are middle prestige anonymize a little less, people who are high prestige anonymize even less. It right? may be predictable to some extent, but note that it's not zero, right? It's not like people are not behaving completely strategically, one could argue. Uh, we also see that patterns by country are pretty prominent and actually different from nature's experience. So for, we see that um, China and India, where like a huge number of submissions to these journals come from, actually anonymize a lot less than authors from countries like Germany and US, where if you go off the literature, you would probably guess they benefit from their identities being visible. Um, okay, so from this we kind of conclude that, you know, there's some strategic behavior going on, but it's not really what you would necessarily predict, and so it's probably not completely strategic. Okay, what are the results of this policy? Um, okay, so panel, so we're gonna look at how positive are reviewers, peer reviewers. Um, the panel on the left will show kind of actual rates uh, before and after the policy. Uh, before the policy will be solid line, after the policy will be dotted. And then maybe the even easier panel to focus on is the, is the change. Like, what's the actual change in positivity? And we see that for low status authors, those with very few citations, reviewers got a little bit more positive, about 2%. Um, for middle status, middle status authors, you know, it's kind of like, you know, kind of borderline significance. It's, you know, point estimate is, you know, also not huge. And then for high status authors, kind of even less of an effect. These are also the authors that don't anonymize as much, so the behavior changed less for them, and you kind of see less of an effect. But it's interesting that even with this anonymous policy, and this we can kind of say kind of causally, it increased positivity of low status authors. 
So then, you know, we're going to look at acceptance, arguably even more important. And here, what's interesting is effects actually get even a little bit bigger. So looking again at low status authors, change before and after, we see that low status authors are now accepted about 5.6% more, uh, more often, which is kind of not, not trivial, I think, for like many of us would love that, right? Um, middle status authors are accepted a little bit less, um, and high status authors don't have as much of an effect. Um, but again, to emphasize, this is you know, a causal effect of giving people the option to anonymize. So uh, we might also worry about unintended consequences, right? Did this affect review recruitment? You know, journalists are only going to care about this a lot, especially if you're like maybe not at the very top of the pyramid or whatever. Um, and broadly, we found no effects. So uh, reviewers accepted invitations at about the same rates. Um, we didn't find a change in the, the you know, prestige of the reviewers, again, measured with citations, and similarly for the authors. So that's kind of, that was sort of good news. Um, so, to sum up, all right, so the conclusion is, I would say, fairly straightforward. So, voluntary anonymization, this seemingly attractive, cheap option to reduce bias, by which we maybe guess wouldn't have worked, actually seems to work. Um, why that is, is probably because, uh, whoops, it's probably because it's not, um, Wait, how did I go back? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's probably because it was, the behavior wasn't quite strategic, like we would, maybe would have feared, so whether you're anonymized or not is not really all that reliable a signal of who you are. Um, so, you know, review positivity went up to 2.4%, acceptances went up 5.6%, medium and high sided authors were affected less. And we found no evidence of unintended consequences, great. Um, so there are a bunch of open questions here, like, what exactly is the mechanism? Like, is it actually the standard kind of like cognitive bias or, you know, if uh, I see like famous person, I assume it's better work or whatever. Um, or is it maybe that reviewers know that this policy is, you know, uh, in the field and so they kind of punish people who don't anonymize because they feel like they should, you know. So there could be, there's some ambiguity about exactly how this is being caused. And I think another question is the long-term effect. Or, like this is, we're speaking relatively short-term here. Would this policy hold up? Would people kind of reach some new equilibrium? Would it be as good-looking as this one? It's kind of unclear. Um, but the sort of, I think the biggest takeaway is that uh, this bias is very common. Here's essentially a free way to reduce it. And so we uh, should probably experiment with that a lot more and hopefully replicate uh, this in other organizations. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi, Dario Torrelli, um, Open Science CCI. Really great work. Um, I'm curious um, if you could share more about the policy itself, how it was implemented. Uh, as reviewers, we all know that uh, the one untold secret is that double anonymization works as long as uh, reviewers don't de-anonymize uh, the author by looking them up and trying to break the, uh, uh, the double blind clause. So was there anything put into place that, if anything, you know, if this still occurs, you may suggest that the, the nominal effect could be even larger if those, these practices didn't exist. So curious about uh, the policy implementation and anything you have to share about that. Yeah, um, going off of what, what you said earlier in the session earlier, it's also like I think a conversation for like a beer and like two, two hours of going into the details. There's a lot going on here that I'm kind of not going into. So one, you know, so first uh, uh, IOP tried to roll this out in um, an enforced way, like kind of usual, quote unquote and first found that it was too expensive, right? So first there's like five journals this was tried in that are not in, in our data set because of they have this kind of more complicated history with the policy, right? So there is like that aspect. Um, in term, you know, then the wording, um, there's like, you know, I think the messaging is really important. Uh, how exactly it was worded, I showed kind of one, you know, snippet from, the liter from their kind of website, uh, there was like, probably a few places that was messaged and maybe with slightly different undertones or overtones, whatever. 
there was like a template given to authors, like, or like a checklist, like make sure you uh, check all these things before you submit. Oh, by the way, it's optional. You know, there was kind of like a little bit of a like nudging and su like strong suggestion vibe to it, I would say. Um, you know, then there's like kind of uh, how it was, like which journals were chosen to go first, like how this, the staggering worked also has some quirks to it. Uh, yeah, you know, happy to chat about all that more. I kind of, we sort of suspect it doesn't affect our re results. It's kind of, our, our, you know, like we excluded the thing that seemed like would kind of, uh, would be quite different from what we actually studied, like th those five journals, but th there are some quirks going on here. There's no guidance, explicit guidance for reviewers. Uh, oh, in terms of... Um, preventing them from like de anonymizing. Yes, yeah, I, I, be I believe there wasn't. At the same time, the policy was announced publicly. So I, I believe the reviewers weren't like sent an additional instruction like, oh, by the way, please don't Google this person. Yeah, everything, like at this, I think everything was designed to be like minimal. Like they, tr they found that it was very costly. They were like, hey, we're just gonna give people the option and then hands off. Like we're not gonna change anything else. That's my impression.